Good evening, everyone, and welcome you all to the third CI conference. I know the first and the second one was at a very small scale. We had called very few CIs and done it according to the zones. But we tried it this time, and it seems like a big success, though a lot of people had told me that it's, this is a wrong time. But I'm sure we will, get, uh, we will have double the numbers if I had a CI conference in winter. So probably next year, we will plan something next year or a year after that. We will plan something in the winters, but I'm very, very happy with the response we've got today. So welcome you all to the CI conference of UC Mass North America. Thank you so much for being here. Though it is a CI conference, we have a lot of franchises here who are pretty much CIs and some of them who are not even CIs, but we still have allowed them to be here because we know that technical strength is the most important strength for UC Mass. If you are technically sound, if you know how the technique works well, then you can surely run the show. Whether you're marketing or not, that comes later on. So investing in your CIs and being able to invest in your CIs, you gotta be a technical director as well. And that's the reasons these franchisees who are not very technical, if they're here, they are surely gonna gain a lot from this conference, we believe so. So not taking any more time, uh, you guys will not need your binders right now, so if you wanna shut it off, you can just close it right now. We're not doing anything from the binders right now because it's not a training right away, uh, which you're all used to using the binders in the training. We are, for the first time ever, discussing about the UC Mass research. Uh, all of us here, I'm not sure, are aware or not that UC Mass students were subjects of research study on mental arithmetic and mental abacus, which was a very prolonged study. There were about three to five years of research study that took place, and it was initiated in UC Mass Canada. Uh, I would really congratulate Yogesh who helped us give us the initial students and then a lot of other centers who gave us students in and around Canada. But because these scientists wanted a huge bunch of students and they wanted uh, the similar financial group also, similar backgrounds f of children because their research should not have any other effects or related effects where uh, the financial background or the genetic or the uh, education background of the parents would be different. So they selected a school in India where UC Mass was part of the subject, is was part of the curriculum, and there they started their main research. And I'm gonna be talking today a little bit about this research because it's important for us to know what these scientists did, how our children behaved and reacted to the research uh, activities which these uh, scientists gave us. And more importantly for us to understand how deeply our children are connected and growing because of our program. So how many of you today believe that UC Mass students benefit uh, and grow in mental arithmetic or mental math, if you call it, or arithmetic computation because of UC Mass. How many of you believe? There should not be one hand that is down. <laughs> we all believe that it, mental arithmetic is a 100% sure shot result in every child, right? We all believe that, right? But we still have a lot of doubts in our minds that is there any other result apart from mental arithmetic? How many of you doubt that? Do you have any doubt that, uh, do you have a lot of doubts that there are uh, more results or there are different kinds of results or different kinds of benefits that we see in our children apart from mental arithmetic? We talk about, we have a lot of flyers, right? In our locations, we have brochures and we talk about benefits all the time. What are the common kinds of benefits you talk about in UC Mass students, apart from mental arithmetic, mental math? Focus, yeah. Sorry? Attention, time management, concentration, 
creativity, oh. yeah. Okay, now these words, yes, we have printed in all our brochures. I know these words, all our brochures have this, all our marketing uh, material has this. And do we all believe all of this is happening? We all believe so, great. So probably the research was not even required then. Yeah, so we all believe all this is happening some or the other way. But many a times it becomes very hard for, the, for us to convince parents, for us to con specifically see some benefits in these children because our activities or, or our program basically deals with math, with arithmetic to be precise. And when we deal with arithmetic and all our demos that we do, uh, for presentations are also uh, connected to mental arithmetic, right? So a lot of times parents ask us such questions that, uh, uh, and when they see the children only for 10, 15, 20 minutes, they don't realize that a lot of other cognitive skills of a child are getting improved. And that is the sole reason, or that was the major, major reason why this research had happened. Because uh, looking at the children, when these scientists approached us, they were also very intrigued with the speeds these children were calculating. The speed was obviously the key thing which they saw in the children was tremendous. And along with that, their accuracy levels was also very, very high with the kind of, you know, mental computation we were giving them. So they were, you know, wanting to believe that there were cognitive benefits the children were getting. but there was very less evidence of it. And that's the reason they started doing this research. Again, we all, we all know that uh, you know, if there is a good family background, good atmosphere at home, uh, parents are helping the children a lot, and you know, motivating children a lot, those children may perform better. But there are a lot of times that they don't have a great atmosphere at home, and the children may not perform as well. That's the reason having a school where children are all of the same background. And that to a very, this school which they selected was a very economical school, like in a neighborhood where there were very uh, low income group people. And uh, what they did is what I'll explain in this presentation now. If you see the first slide, you may not be able to read in fine print. I will name the scientists who were there, the major scientists. There were a group of about eight to 10 scientists who came throughout. But the major scientists or the doctors were Dr. George from uh, University of Howard, Dr. David Barner from UCSD, University of San Diego, Dr. Michael Frank from University of San Stanford. So these are no joke. You know, these people who had come to us was a very unique experience which we had. And we were also not sure that what will happen in these tasks. We were not. We were confident, but we were not 100% sure on the results. So what was the research goal? The research goal was to investigate efficacy of mental abacus training versus additional hours of regular international math curriculum. So children who were selected were given part of these children, like there were 200 children selected, 200 were given mental abacus, and the other 200 were given extra math curriculum, extra math Co coaching or tutoring for the regular international math curriculum. The test whether mental arithmetic training has effects on other cognitive abilities, example, attention, memory, conceptual understanding, estimation. That was the test all about. The method of the test, 215 children randomly assigned to receive either three hours of per week of extra math or three hours of abacus training provided by a school teacher. The other important thing about this research was that those school teachers were trained for abacus learning. They were not coming to our centers where we can give them a controlled environment. They were in the school and these school teachers were trained on the abacus. So they were get getting the exact same way of training for their math curriculum and abacus training. So that way also they controlled the group. Uh, Annual assessment of arithmetic, math abilities, attention, memory, conceptual understanding, user paper assessments, and computer games. All these different kinds of activities were given to the children. These are the list of assessments that the children did. I will go through a little bit quickly on each, of each kind of assessment that the children did. 
Part of it, yes, was very much close to what we do in our class. But a lot of it was not close to what we do in our class. And that's what proved that UC Mass children are capable and fit to do a lot more than we think they are. They are. So talking about the cognitive skills enhanced by UC Mass, which we were thinking and which these scientists were also planning to check on the children or test on the children, were perception, attention, memory, motor skills, visual and spatial processing, and executive functions. Executive functions, to be precise, are flexibility, time management, problem solving, decision making, multitasking, emo emotional self-regulation, and sequencing. These are big words, but they do happen. Each of them happen. Coming to the basic theories or the major theories that were used during these tests. One of the theories that was used is called the Raven's Progressive Matrix. If you see the image in that theory, this is a very, if you see the, if, if um, like uh, some of you would know what SAT tests or the GMAT tests that come later on in uh, school and for university, Children do these kind of tests, and even mental ability test books, if you see, there these kind of tests are given in there. But our children in day-to-day -day life are not doing these kind of tests. So this was one of the ways where there were patterns given, and the children had to find the next pattern. That, that was obviously the simplest way. There were also numbers given, and they had to find the next number. So there were uh, patterns and sequencing of numbers and patterns. So it was not only images, but also numbers. So after these tests, especially in this first Raven's Progressive Matrix, what was happening was the most key element about these tests was the scientists had made these programs, which, were the ch which the children were using, very adaptive. If a child would bypass a test, the test would become tougher. So every time the level one was cleared, the child would go to level two, level three, level four, and level five. And if wrong answers increased, the automatically the test would reduce the complexity. So that's how they had programmed these things for the children, so that we can keep getting an average output from the children, because we wanted a long-term effect. We talk about and skills are long-term. We cannot just test one or two times and decide that the children are good. Right? So they were very adaptive tests. So see, the major benefit they found out of this test was the reasoning ability in children. Because every time you, have see, you see a sequence or a pattern, you should be able to reason out what happens next. So the reasoning ability of children was tremendously uh, checked in this, and they were extremely happy with the general reasoning ability, reason, general intelligence of reasoning ability in children. The other test that, was, uh, that took place was the Shepard and Matrix mental rotation test. If you see those two images, I'll give you other images of the rotation test as well. The images were uh, three types, four types, five types, six types, because they would rotate from zero to 180 degrees. And what did they do in this mental rotation? They would show one image to the child and then they would show another image. This another image was rotated from zero to 180 degrees, and they had to recognize whether the first image was equal to the next image. They, they, they would give about five to six different images, and the children had to find two similar images. Even then, the images were rotated. So sometimes the children were, you know, the children had to see one image, and the other image would just not look like the first image because it was tremendously rotated from 0 to 180 degrees. But even then, the children were able to bypass this test very brilliantly. So this is a very unique kind of test. Going to the next slide, there's another form of rotation which they did. Obviously, this was easier than the previous one, because previous one had different, different sizes and shapes of cubes. But all kinds of mental rotation uh, that the children were taking, uh, you know, testing on, they were able to do it very efficiently. And this is a very unique way of perception in children. 
perception is a very, very important thing, which we don't feel that maybe through UC Mass, children may not be able to perceive well. But perception is the biggest benefit of mental rotation, which is a very unique benefit which we can get through our program. Moving to the next slide, general ability. General ability, if you see, again, different kinds of images, children would have to find the next image. This is, again, general mental ability, which we don't test in our program daily. We don't check whether mental ability of children is improving or not. But through this, they could easily test it, and children were doing very well in that. Going to the next slide is the standardized math test. Obviously, children excelled it tremendously because our children are very good at doing this. There was another test of simple arithmetic, a cakewalk for our children. This was also part of the test. Going to the next one, Abacus flashcards. Again, an excellent test, which children did very well. There were place value tests. A lot of our franchisees keep telling us that uh, our children are not able to uh, many times do school arithmetic that well as when they do it, uh, when they do UC mass. And we should train them on school arithmetic as well. Or maybe we should guide them on how to you know, balance the mental abacus at school. But if you see these tests, place value tests are very simple, but they were done because to prove that you don't need to train children for any school arithmetic. Children will automatically be able to understand it if they do mental arithmetic well, if they do the mental abacus well. Moving to the next slide, commutativity. In that, what they're doing is the children are connecting one figure to the other. So they are able to communicate between one figure to the other figure. They were done basically, if you see the first question, it's six is equal to six or not. That's a simple question, true or false. There were questions like 53 times 18 is equal to 16 times 53 or not. So they had to do a relativity kind of relationship building between these figures. Again, a very unique way of testing children where how they're able to relate well. They had to do true and false in that. Obviously, there was an abacus uh, test as which, which was the easiest for our, all our children. So, but that was also part of the test. Moving to the next slide, a very important side, verbal memory. This is one thing which our franchisees or CS are mostly not convinced that verbal memory will be a memory which our children will improve in. But the verbal memory test was also very uniquely handled. Children were given different kinds of words. They were given, they, they were also given synonyms, and they also had to select a word, what they felt after reading that particular word. So when they said morning, the children had to say whether it was pleasant, mildly pleasant, unpleasant, very unpleasant, and things like that. Now, they had to circle these words, you know. They had to connect and circle these words, what they felt. After that, they had to, they were given a blank sheet. There was no order required, as in the first answer has to be the second, or there was no order required, but they had to remember the exact word which they saw in the previous slide, what word was it, and what meaning they had selected. But they could randomly write it. They could, so whatever they could remember, they had to write it. So verbal memory was also tested that way, which we feel a lot of times that, you know, the visual memory or the auditory memory improves, but the verbal memory does not. But verbal memory was also tested, which is very unique, which is very, very important for us. The other test which was very interesting was the computer games. And there were dot arrays. If you talk about dot arrays, what are dot arrays? There are different kinds of dots on one side, and there'll be different kinds of dot on the other side. Children had to match how many similar dots they saw very quickly. Sometimes they to the first, the first image had about 15 blue colored dots and 20 yellow colored dots. And then in the next image, there were vice versa. So they were shown different kinds of dot arrays in different, different ways. I'm just giving you one or two examples. But they were given different, different kinds of dot arrays. And they had to do 
relativity, they had to do memory, they had to do the connection. So these were the things which they did with dot arrays and they were very unique. When you look at a hundred dots, at times you don't understand what is the number. So they had to do the estimation because they had to sometimes write the number of dots they saw. Next time they had to do whether the dots they saw, the blue colored dots they saw were the same as the blue colored dots in the next slide. So they had to relate and then also do estimation. So a lot of benefits which we talk about were checked through the dot arrays and computer games which they did. So all in all, I know I went a little too fast with these uh, theories, but I know I, I did not want to make it very, very boring for all of you. But all in all, if you see, these research studies that happened are a proof enough for us to talk with conviction about the cognitive benefits that we talk about in our children. If any of you do not believe in it, if any of you have any doubts in it, you should not have any doubts anymore because sometimes it's hard to prove it. But through these tests, hello, yeah, we have used 215 children there. Apart from that, about 150 children were used in Canada in different times and about 321 children again in Gujarat. These were not from schools, but these were center, students from our centers. They were also tested. The beauty about the test was that every time the child was given a test, the whole day, you know, children were given very limited time for these tests. By the end of the day, the program which these scientists had would crash. They had to actually reprogram it to the level where it becomes more adaptive. I have seen that so many times when the test tests were happening because the program was adaptive, as I said in the beginning, that if the child is able to do 20 correct sums, it would reach to 21 and then 22, you know, it would increase its adaptability and they would cross the threshold. And that is the most unique thing which we feel that, and that is what we all need to believe in, that sky is the limit. If we train children for more and more and faster and faster mental arithmetic, there is no limit to it. When CIs come and talk to us that we tried so much and they're not holding the abacus, we tried so much and they're not holding the pencil, we don't have, we're not able, sometimes when I listen to the listening exercise speed in the class, I feel let's not do it anymore because the speed which we used to talk about have gone away somewhere. This is the reason we all need to understand that we will not pressurize the children. We also need to be adaptive. We need to know what kind of children we have in our class. Many times when they are doing a lot of wrong sums, we can give them easier sums in between. But it doesn't mean that we have to stop giving them tougher sums. Many times when we see an intermediate A class does not mean we have to start three-digit calculations. Probably they are still not fit for three-digit calculations. You need to do two-digit with them. So you have to be adaptive with your own children, but do not limit yourself that I cannot, you know, and you will limit yourself only if you're not prepared for that class. If as a CI, you do not, you're just using that typical listening exercise book which was given to every child, then probably you're not there. That is a guideline we give, but there is a lot of work the CIs need to do. When we were trained as CIs, we got a very thin little listening exercise book, and we were asked to make listening exercise calculations for every level, at least eight to 10 pages for every level. We have handmade listening exercise calculations we used to make for each and every kind of child. And we still have a lot of CIs who keep doing that because only then you understand the kind of children you are treating and where you will limit yourself and where you will go fast. So that's very important for us to understand that this research has proved each one of us wrong if we do not believe in the cognitive benefits that we are giving to our children. Yes. We are a mental arithmetic program. We are a mental math program. Mental math abilities are tremendously improving. Math grades going up is a proven fact, but cognitive skills are also improving and we have to prove it to believe in it. Do you have any questions from the research? Yes.
Wait, wait. There has uh, there has a lot of paper uh, white paper done. Uh, we can give you the links of where uh, this white paper was. Uh, there is a part of it on our website as well, and there is another part which we need to get. I think by the end of this year we will get that, which will also be published. Yeah, that would be great because yes. I would like to see it in detail. Sure, sure. And one more question. We need another mic, and if you could, yeah. Uh, about measuring scales, the, uh, do we have a data comparison between both the groups showing? There is a lot of content these scientists have, and this is like the mini most miniature version which I could, uh, you know, display here. Uh, not all of it is uh, available for public, uh, you know, n uh, sharing, but uh, we may have a lot of sheets that will have the different kinds of uh, you know patterns that we gave to the children. So what exactly uh, do you think uh, you're looking at? Like the data, the data comparison. That oh, the data comparison between what happened to the groups, other children. Yeah. I am not sure whether we got the exact table because they were, they, we are not allowed to get every paper watch they had. But I can surely look up if they can, uh, if it has the data comparison between normal subjects and mental arithmetic UC math subjects. I will surely look, right. look that up. And the last question. Uh, all the scales that were used to measure their uh, abilities and yes. in all the areas, were they validated at all by no. someone or were no. they developed by this scientist itself? No, they were, they, these, uh, they were. A of them were validated because I can see they had uh, titles, but some of them, are they all validated by? They're you? all validated uh, tasks. The, all these tasks were only based out, s out of some theories that they got connected to. There were no tasks. There were only mental arithmetic tasks that are from our program without validation because they were tasks from our program. Uh, all the other tasks were given from the theories which they used. So they were only uh, outshoots of the theories which they used. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Mega. <coughs> Hi, Mega. OK, the, the question is, uh, when they selected a group from Canada, were uh, community or the ethnicity diversity nothing, was? Nothing was. Nothing was. Uh, so that's the reason uh, the, the major research happened only with the school children in Gujarat. There were small groups of children that got selected. A lot of our franchisees know that they had sent children uh, to the head office, Anton and Yogesh, and a lot of, lot of other franchisees. So they were from our centers. They were only random children who were interested in the study had uh, come in there. So that's the reason the research paper is majorly not on the students that were from our locations. Because uh, that could be a little biased, they thought. That's the reason the research paper is more from uh, the school, school children which they tested. Yeah, the, the, the question was a little different. The question is, uh, in Canada, there's a diversity. In Canada, there is a diversity, right? And uh, whenever we face uh, uh, the diverse group or the different ethnicity group, they would like to know that, you know, they, they have a belief that the South Asian children are pretty strong in their <coughs> schools, whether you take China, India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. or the, the other part of that area. Mm -hmm. They're pretty strong in their math skills. But what about the European children? What about the North American children? What about the African children? So on and so forth. And therefore, those questions keeps coming. So if we use this research paper as our background, would those paper answers the questions like? That's the reason the first five minutes I spent on the economical background of these children. This is a very, very, I can probably sometimes, next I can share, share the images of the school. If you see, it's a very, uh, very humble school. Uh, and a very um, non-financially uh, very low income groups. So we are not looking at children who have a big background of uh, parents who were wanting their children to having math skills or even education skills. So these, that's the reason this research is important for us because we are not looking at preconceived uh, you know, math abilities in children. And they were very young elementary children who were selected before they got any other skills from anywhere else. Very young elementary children were selected for these uh, tasks. Okay, thanks. Please speak into the mic. 
we can i will not have the data for everything right away right now and how well was obviously the conclusion was such that every task they did have they have performed very well in the tasks the the major result of the task uh, of all the task was that the children were uh, if they have basic genetic ability obviously they perform better that is what they reasoned out but even if they don't have there were the perception reasoning attention and math abilities were the major things that they felt has improved Our program has focused on the specific ones, especially the pictorial ones yes like, so i was yeah. thinking how did that jive in? i will not have a, a, a complete chart of right away how well they did in each tasks but uh, even those scientists may not have very particular because they obviously did an overall uh, you know um, research on these children but there could be individual papers where uh, how they did well on reasoning how they did well on perception and things like that so there will be data on all that as well but this was just a touch base for you guys to understand that when these children are a were able to do these things very well that means there is possibility for us to believe that uh, perception and reasoning also tremendously improves yes if if i may request everyone that please wait for the mic and uh, yes uh, what was the age group the age group was elementary school so it was from grade 1 to 4 okay so it was 6 to 8 years 6 to 7 uh, sorry 6 to 9 6 to 9 yeah and uh, our program don't have anything with age if the kid knows the number we are taking the kids and encouraging them to learn more yeah and uh, most of the kids in our center, like are in junior, senior kindergarten, who are learning the numbers, and we advertise like they're going to really improve in this field. So how that you going to? I think we are going to another part of the whole question uh, session. First of all, we do not encourage children who are uh, uh, three-year-olds, so junior kindergartens, to uh -huh. start. We we expect children to be. Mo most of the time in senior kindergarten when they should start, they should have their basic uh, number skills and they should know numbers up to 1 to 50 and then only then they should start. So this is a different question uh, altogether. This has no connection to what age group we are starting. This is only a average research. If you think about the UC Mass students worldwide, 6 to 9 is the maximum age group that we have in UC Mass. So we will have to select the children whom that are maximum. We cannot, you know, just start selecting four-year-olds and uh, twelve-year-olds. This is not a research for those kind of children. There will be another research study which will be required for what happens at an age four. You know, so that's a different. Uh, that will be a different. Yes, very much. Okay, so uh, not taking any further questions and moving on. Where's my guy from here? Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next part of the presentation today, so we don't stick to one topic and you know make it boring. Uh, we talked about the cognitive benefits till now, right? Give or take, sometimes yes, sometimes no, as you know, reasoning became an issue, or sometimes uh, perception becomes an issue, or sometimes even memory becomes an issue that we don't believe that you know, UC Mass will improve uh, these kind of things. But the other thing which we all probably believe are the learning capabilities in a child. When we talk about our program, like uh, if, I, if I remember 10 years ago, this is not something we used to talk about. We used to, we, our sales pitch was very different. You know, Anand and I started uh, 10 years ago with a very different uh, sales pitch or uh, concept learning of UC Mass. And today, uh, we have become a little different from what we started at that point. The reason is not that we did not uh, believe in those things, but today we, a lot of more people have made sure that we believe in all these things and that's the reason uh, we start using these uh, this skill sales pitch now and it talks about the learning capabilities in a child or the learning um, styles that we talk about what do you what do you know about what do we all know about learning styles how do you think a child or a human being learns 
or the different ways of how a human being or a child learns. Yeah, so listening is a very important way of learning. So an auditory learner, a child or a human being could be an auditory learner. Visual, Visual learner, yes. Tactile. And tactile learner. These are the three different ways we all know where any human being or to be precise, a child learns, right? But if I may ask, what do you mean by learning? What answer? To know something is learning, okay. How good you, how well you grasp the concept, okay, that's learning. What else? Understanding, Understanding well is learning, yes. It's about acquisition. Okay, I like that word, yes. Retention, that's important, I like it. Achieving anything new is good, yeah. But is that learning? Yeah, not sure. Yes, yes. Collecting information, okay. Yes. Being able to explain it is important, yes. Implementation, very important. Okay, so. Reaction of particular action. Reaction, okay, reaction to after learning. Retaining information, I think he said retention, <coughs> yes, very important. Yes? Reflect, very, very important. Okay, so this is not a test on what learning means and this is not a synonym uh, quiz going on, on learning. But there is a one simple line of learning which I believe is very important for all of us to understand and a lot of you gave me very close answers to what you know, I felt learning is all about. Learning is nothing but a long-term behavioral change. So when we talk about reaction, when we talk about retention, when we talk about reflection, that is what I believe is learning. Learning is nothing but a long-term behavioral change. Now that behavior does not mean how softly you were talking before and how loudly you talk today, or not that behavior. It could be any activity which you're doing. If there is a long-term change in it, today, you know, I will give a big lecture and then we will, Poochan Shashwati will discuss a lot of matters, we step out of the room. Okay, good. Out of that, 10, 20% of information stays and then the remaining goes away. Right? And that's what naturally happens. So that is not learning. So if you want to learn today, and if we, each one of us want to learn, we will have to think of long-term behavioral change. And I see only one or two people making notes. So I will really like if you like make more notes and try to grab the keywords that we talk about today. Because we want this session to go a long way and help us all. I'm not saying I don't need to learn, us all learn, because I'm also going to learn a lot of things, because I don't need such a powerhouse of information very, very often. So we meet tons of children every day, and you may have a lot of more information than I have about UC Mass children. So I'm also ready to learn today. But long-term behavioral change is what I'm looking at, at learning. And if we are able to make our children learn, or make our children have a long-term behavioral change after they become UC Mass graduates, then probably we have done our jobs as course instructors. I think I need. I also need my piece of paper. So when we, when we said, you know, uh, you all gave me, quickly gave me answers for different kinds of learners. We know auditory learners, visual learners, tactile learners. And we know that through UC Mass, we can easily vouch that we are triggering all kinds of learning. You know, we know auditory learning is easily possible through UC Mass because half of our exercises are listening. We know tactile learning is the integral part of UC Mass listen until you are good at the physical abacus, you will never be able to do anything in UC Mass. So that's nothing but kinesthetic tactile learning. And 
The third is the visual learning. When the tactile and the auditory has happened well, visual learning is an automatic process in our program, right? So we know this is a very, very unique program. Do we, does anyone have any other example that uses or improves all the three learning styles in a child? Uh, is my question uh, clear enough? Can you Everyone got? Can you repeat the so what I'm expecting is, is there any other way, any other program, any other way, any other activity which a child does through which all these three learning abilities of a child get triggered, enhanced, improved? Piano does uh, visual, auditory, and tactile. It does not do visual. Uh, what did you say? Somebody else? It also does visual? Maybe. Yes. Nothing that we can right away think. Nothing that pops out of our head right away. There could be a little bit. I'm not saying nothing else does, does you know. Video games, yes. <laughs> no, I, uh, I know, I know, I wish, I wish, right? I wish if video games did that. So, yes, are we not proud that this is one of the very, very few, if I not say the only program th that improves, triggers, enhances, pushes, stimulates all the learning capabilities in a child? So we got to believe that learning is for sure happening in our program. But whether we are bringing that learning process or whether we are bringing that long-term behavioral change in our kids or not, that is a question we all need to ask ourselves. By the way, there are two sheets given extra for you to write. There are ruled sheets after, yeah, okay, you all found it, great. So now we need to know that if we are firmly believing that all these three learning styles are very much part of our program and we can surely trigger and improve all these learning styles in a child, then we need to find what our program does and why if sometimes you're not able to achieve this. So what does our program do? Can we go to the next slide? There's a theory of flow. This theory is not given by any scientist, so you cannot ask me questions on the theory. This is a very regular, simple theory. There is a theory of flow where in our program, what happens is, and what does the theory of flow do? The theory of flow do, does something very, very simple. If there is an ability for a child to do something like mental arithmetic, what is our prerequisite? We expect children to recognize numbers between 1 to 50, 1 to 20, or whatever, so they know numbers. So they have the ability to recognize numbers on the abacus. So there is an ability we start with. And then that ability, we start converting that into challenge. When they know one is like this, then we ask them to do one plus one. So we're challenging them to the next step. And this process keeps going on in UCMAS. They do one digit three rows calculations in 10 minutes. Then they do one digit three, three rows in five minutes, and then they do one digit three rows in one minute, and, and then they do one digit three rows in 30 seconds, right? So every time their ability is tested with time, then we also challenge their ability with, challenge their ability with more digits. So we move to four digits, we move to five digits, we move to, I don't know, five digits, 10 rows or whatever. So every time the ability increases, the challenge is also increased. So there is a flow in our program. And this is a very renowned theory, theory of flow. The ability in is, is increasing and the challenge is given more. So more ability increase, again more challenge given, again more ability increase. And that is what our levels are made. Because we don't have anything apart from numbers in our books. Right? A lot of parents come and ask us, oh, you, you just have these numbers, no word problems, nothing, this, that, right? So, because we believe in the theory of flow, we just want the child to improve his challenge and improve his ability. So that's what we believe in our theory. If there is a theory 
that we believe in. So do you believe that if there is ability in a child and he's given challenge, his ability will improve, right? And then we can challenge him a little more so his ability will improve a little more? Do we all believe in so, in that? Yes. But even then we get dropouts, right? Even then the children are not all the time happy. Even then we know that there are a lot of issues we face in the classes, right? If we believe that our program is based on the theory of flow, if we believe that theory of flow works, then why is it not working on every child in the class? That is my question, right? And I'm not asking you to really think about what the answer is, because I have the answer. Okay, can we go to the next slide? There is a break point in the theory of flow, and that is either anxiety or boredom. We can have, when I, when I ask CIs to write, why did the children, why did this, did this child drop out? Or why do children drop out in your class? They will make a list of things, you know. They were not coming on time, the parents were not supporting, the child was not focusing only, he does not know how to concentrate, he never rolled the abacus, he never brought the pencil, he never did the homework, or he was never doing listening exercises at home, they were never doing flashcards well, and a ton of other reasons which we can give that the child is dropping out, why? Right? But we know that the children drop out because of only two reasons. Either there is anxiety or there is boredom. Do we believe it in, in it or not? To a certain extent, if not 100%. So the anxiety and the boredom both can be taken care. If we know that the anxiety is coming up or the boredom is going to come up, can we as CIs try and manage these feelings of a student? Yes, we can, right? We just need to do some simple steps, some simple thinking for that. So for that, what we need to do is, we need to have different strategies, right? We need to have different strategies for different kinds of children. If the children are having anxiety, that means they are probably not able to get it. So we need a little more practice for them. If they're getting bored, then we need to have sheets and practice sheets ready for them, or maybe we need to engage them in different ways so we can discuss about a ton of things what we need to do to get rid of anxiety or boredom. By the way, do we all believe that there could be only anxiety and boredom because of which children uh, would not drop out? What do you think? Economic reasons, okay. That is also an anxiety, form of anxiety, right? Sorry? Child, the parent will indirectly push, pass on the anxiety to the child. So it's the child. All the time it's the child. If the parent is not economically doing well or financially or even uh, there's a broken home, it will come on the child. That anxiety is some or the other way coming on the child. Yeah. So there has to be... If, if you know, even if you try to make those 50 set of reasons why a child drops out, I, I firmly believe it will all come down under anxiety or under boredom, eventually, some or the other way. So we got to start believing that only, there are only two reasons. Because if we believe that there are about 50 reasons, you'll have to find answers for all of them, right? But if we believe only two reasons, it becomes that the mind has you know, has thought that the problem is not that big. Only two problems, right? So that will help us to find the reasons why and how we can get rid of anxiety or how we can get rid of boredom. Now, when we want the CIs to know and find reasons of anxiety and boredom, it's important that the CIs also think, start thinking about learning. When I said learning is nothing but a long-term behavioral change, Half of this uh, hall has CIs that are with me since more than like eight years, nine years, right? So they're there since UC Mass was pretty much here. And uh, so we all need to come, have we all reached a point of learning? Have we all as CIs reached to that long-term behavioral change in ourselves? It is, a, it is a learning phase every single day, but 
there has to be a level of learning we are looking at because we cannot pass our own threshold as adults. Children's, children have a very higher threshold, but we adults have a limited capacity. So we can reach up to our threshold to a certain extent, but we almost can't reach there at this age now. So we need to have a level where we feel that we have learned, right? And for that, there is something which I believe we all need to do. And that is called, we were talking about cognition in children. So we as CIs need to do metacognition because we don't have trainers. You meet Pooja once in a while and that, that's the only training you've done, right? Many of you had met Radhika or some other moderators we had in the past. But that's the only way. It's not like students who are meeting you every two hours. They have uh, teachers at home, moms at home. So there are different ways they can keep learning. But we don't get that opportunity. So what we need to do is we need to do metacognition. And what is metacognition? Any of you? No. It's not an English class. So no one knows what metacognition is? Metacognition is something very, very simple. It's thinking about your own thinking. Like she said, reflection, that's also a way of learning. So metacognition is nothing but reflection. It's thinking about your own thinking. So probably you're not gonna think after this, you know, after this session, we're all gonna think, oh, Mika was talking too much. Probably, oh, her dress was this, or her nail polish was like that. We can think about those things. And we can also think about what kind of words, which dictionary did she follow today? What kind of words did she get from? Where did all this research happen, right? So we, we are gonna get all kinds of questions after this session is over, but are we gonna be able to bring any change in our own lives after this session is over? Are we gonna think about our own thinking? As in today, I do this much for my children to improve on anxiety and boredom I will do this much more. Have we given that chance to our own selves? And how do adults learn? Or even children probably learn in the same way. But how do adults learn? Not only by metacognition. Not many people do metacognition. In day-to-day -day life, there is so much to do. Uh, making lunches for children, making box, lunch boxes for us, running around, taking care of so many, dropping the children to school, coming back, then going back to work, then like the, the list is endless. We don't have that 10 minutes for ourselves to sit and think, oh, what did I do today? Okay, not many people have that chance. And even if you are sitting, probably are you thinking what is required to be thought? Are you thinking of something productive or positively engaging to improve yourself? I have my doubts. Not many people have the time to do that for your own self. That is an investment you need to make in your own self. And how do you do these things? There are two ways of learning we adults have. One is prescriptive learning that are called prescriptive practices. And the other is reflective learning, reflective practices. What is UC Mass? UC Mass is a very, has Pooja given you day-wise schedules for every level? You got trained for, you got uh, uh, day-wise schedules, right? And uh, if, if you did not have the latest day-wise schedule, it was emailed to you. And what does day-wise schedule do? What does, what does it do? It, it is very prescriptive, yeah? It has, Lesson one, day one, page number this, 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 flashcards this digit to this digit, listening exercise from here, very prescriptive, very precise, right? So you have all learned through that practice. But is that working to the extent we were expecting it to work? Not exactly. It is working, it does work, but there need to be reflective practices as well, reflective learning practices as well. And what do we mean by reflective? Be dynamic, be adaptive, do some metacognition so that you can use or make the best use of those prescriptive practices that were given to you. But how many of we have tried to do that? Unfortunately, what happens for us is we live in these four. Can we go to the next slide, please? Probably it's not very visible. 
but I'll read through what we have there. In our metacognition process, we need to know where we are. There are four levels where we all belong to. And you guys do not need to tell me anything, do not need to tell anything to your friends today, but find which position you belong to. One is unconscious incompetence. Many times we are totally unconscious, we are totally unaware that we are incompetent in whatever we are doing. And a lot of us belong to that place, unconscious incompetence. Don't react and do not tell me if you are in, in an unconscious incompetence level. And probably you will not even know because you are unaware, you are unconscious. So even today you will not come to know whether you are incompetent or not. But you will try to, you will need to try and figure out. And that will come out if your children are not showing the kind of results, if you have a lot of dropouts, if your parents are not too happy, there is some kind of incompetence that is there with you and you're not aware about it. So that is the first level where we need to be aware about. That are we unconscious of our incompetence? And if we are, we will need to find ways. We can go to the head office, we can probably talk to our franchise directors, we can talk to other CIs who have experience and ask, how can I be competent? So when you become aware that you are unconscious and you are unaware of your incompetence, then you reach to the level of conscious incompetence. That today I am conscious now, now I am aware that I am incompetent. I need to find ways how I can improve and make sure that the classes are run better. That is a conscious incompetence level. That is the second level we can go to. And if we are conscious, obviously we will not sit we will try to find ways to become consciously competent now. So that is the third step that should come into your metacognition that after being consciously incompetent, you reach to the level of consciously competent. You have to be conscious and you start becoming competent. And that is a very good level to stay because you want to be conscious that you are competent, so that you keep working on it. Like for example, if I am conscious that I am, uh, I have a family background of gaining weight, so I'm always conscious, yeah, and I'm aware that if I eat this, I'm gonna gain weight. If I eat that, I'm gonna gain weight, because my mom did it, you know? So I am conscious about my diet all the time. So I, so that way, I'm always thinking that I need to be on my toes. So if I'm in a UC mass class, I know, these two children always come late. I need to figure out a way how they come on time. These two children never wear a UCMAS t-shirt. So I'll need to find ways where I can give them points or I can encourage them so that they wear the UCMAS t-shirt. These children are always bad at doing homework or they do half the homework or they just write the answers to show that the homework was over. So we are conscious on each and every child's habits and we are trying to find ways how we can engage these children and improve these children. That's how you're consciously competent. But these things do happen, keep happening in your class, but you're consciously incompetent about it. You're aware, oh, this child is always gonna come late. But I'm incompetent, I'm really not gonna be able to do anything. You start believing in that fact. You, you know, very happily, nicely talk to the parent, the parent goes away. Oh, today we, uh, there was so much traffic, today we had to go there, this, that. The parent give, will give different kinds of reasons, but they'll always be late. So you're conscious, but even then you're incompetent. But you have to reach to a level of conscious competence. And then by practicing that conscious competence for a long period of time, you can reach a level of unconscious competence. Your habit, and that's what learning is. That when I am consciously competent, uh, uh, sorry, when I am unconsciously competent, my learning has happened. I don't need to be aware that I'm competent. I'm abs that has become part of me. Invariably, I will not have to remind myself. If I know that that cake, piece of cake is gonna give me more weight, I don't need to remind myself that I don't have to eat the cake. I will just walk out, I know. But till I am, you know, consciously competent, I will, every time I'll see the cake, 
I'll feel I want to heat it, then I'll consciously make myself aware, no, no, I don't have to eat it, and then I go away. And there will reach a point that when I see the piece of cake, and I will still feel, I'll not feel anything. Because I know now that I'm not going to be having the cake. Because that gives me whatever, the reason why I don't want to have it. So that is the level we want to reach, that, that competence becomes totally unconscious in our minds and our bodies that we will perform, we will make sure that every student in my class will reach a process of learning, but that is possible only I, if I have reached a position or process of learning. If the children want to learn, if the children need to learn, if the children need to be at the position of learning, I need to be at the position of learning. Is that correct or not? So okay, a lot of lecture is over for me from my side. Any questions till now? After? Okay, you want to do the questions later on. The other thing which you know is important for us to understand that if we do reach a level of unconscious competence, we will empower ourselves. Because only with reflection, only with reflective practices, we can empower ourselves. So we all need to believe that we don't became, we did not become UCMA CIs because there was nothing else to do, because we needed pocket money, because we are available uh, half day in the evening. Not those reasons. We are in UCMAS because we believe in it. And not just because we believe in it because it's giving fast, uh, you know, making children human calculators. We believe in it because we want to grow as individuals. We want to empower ourselves as human beings. If we believe in that, only then we can bring that change in our children. So thank you so much, ladies. I will move to the next segment or ladies and guys as well a lot of guys we have sorry yeah uh